Okay, let us go ahead and get ourselves started with the second half of session eight. What we want to do now is actually move on to sort of thinking about the whole issue of, given that we have a bunch of printing panels, how do we start adjusting their appearance in different ways? How do we sort of adapt them so we can do different things that are sort of interesting to create either uh, patterns that we like or using information from an external source? And it could be like an image file or an Excel data file to some other source of data to say something about how thick or how big or how wide the opening should be. There's all sorts of things we can do as we start to adjust the parameters. Um, there's a good example to look at that I won't show you in class today because I want to sort of move ahead into some of this, you know, how you apply it. But when you get a chance, go back and look at 8.3. And you may have seen that in watching the videos from last time. It's the idea of a parametric stadium. It's based on a number of arcs of circles, but ribs for trusses, as well as a lot of panels along the outside, sort of get a place to it. It's a pretty good example that unifies a lot of what we've been talking about. So, you know, kind of march on down through that. It's actually a really kind of good and interesting example that pulls a lot of things together. Okay, what I wanted to do is actually look at 8.4, this whole notion of creating patterns, and then we'll get into the images and the color to kind of think about really how we started adapting panels. And the basis for all of this is really we're going to create a whole series of panels, and there's a couple of things we can do that work really well for changing those panels. The two biggest functions that we use a lot of in terms of changing the panels are either element, kind of set parameter by name, and that's a useful one whenever we want to go through and do something like change, oh, an instance parameter. So this is all about, it could be an instance parameter, that's probably the most common thing that we could go through and uh, change on a panel by panel basis. So in the aperture opening, for example, it's the width of the kind of little side panels. And there's a rectangular panel with opening. There's an uh, opening that is anywhere from like 0 0.05 to 0.45. And basically, the panel gets bigger, or the opening gets bigger or smaller, depending on what value you put in there. So we tend to use that to go and change instance parameters that are available to us, and that's a very powerful thing to do. You think about openings, you can think about if you had a panel that had some sort of opening or closing, like either an oculus or some fins that move, we can sort of adjust the parameters so that they swing around and do what's necessary to kind of be appropriate for each of those different panels. The other function that is really very common for this is just element override color. I think it's in view. I think it's just in view. We'll take a look at it. Okay. Now, element override color in view is useful from the standpoint of giving you some feedback about either the things that are very directly exposed or not so directly exposed or a bubble level. You set some criteria and then you do a color map of some type that maps values to some colors and then you display them on the, on the uh, element. Element color override view, you should know, though, only applies to like shaded models. So if you have a shaded model in Revit, you can see it. You can take screenshots, get some feedback about what things are doing. It doesn't actually change the elements themselves, though. So changing the parameter values actually has an effect if you rendered, if you took it outside of Revit, you know, the geometry changes. This is really more just kind of, oh, kind of a fun thing to do to provide a little feedback to you. Okay, so, and we're actually going to use them in combination with each other. Overriding color in view is the easiest thing to do. If we just want to change the color of the panels and display them in a different color, we can use that. If we want to sort of make the panels thicker or thinner to create this emboss or deboss effect, then we'll actually set some parameters based on numbers based on the colors. Okay, so that's really where we're going. So let me start with just this whole notion of creating patterns. The idea is when you have a whole bunch of different panels and they're a big old list, it's pretty easy to go through and create panel or patterns because if you wanted to create a checkerboard pattern or every third panel to do something a little bit different, it's really easy to go through and say, get different items in the list at a numeric position and change them. So let's just take a look at that first. That's kind of a little warm up. So if you open up 8.4, we'll just sort of see what that's all about. Go to 8.4. And this is a pretty boring structure right here. <laughs> it's 
a wall of panels. Let's just take a look at it in 3D. Okay. But, you know, it's not too bad in terms of what's going on. What this is is a whole series of different panels that have been sort of placed. Okay. We can take a look at them. Right now it's probably a hidden line view. If I shade it, get a little more color information to look at. Okay, but let's open up the Dynamo file and just play with this for a second and kind of see what we can do. So hopefully the Dynamo scripting should look pretty straightforward to you. We'll see, I forget whether I did this with a surface or I did it with some lines, but I must have done some quadding and just uh, kind of pulled this all together, put some just rectangular panels on it. Okay, so let's take a look over here. That's not good looking. It's a little, my preview is a little broken right now, but I'm not going to worry about that too much. I should restart Revit to get rid of this thing. It basically is telling me the little rendering into the background didn't start up properly. That's what that stuff in the background is. But let's just keep on going in the interest of time for you guys. So what am I doing here? I basically have, oh, what I'm really doing is actually just going through and creating some uh, different points. And what am I doing here? I'm creating some lines. This funny little chunk of code is really just saying the x values are always going to be 0, the y values are 0 and 50, and the z values are 0, 10, and 20. So what those are is that's really giving me just a series of x, y, z coordinates for three lines. And then I'm sort of breaking them up and hopefully saying make three different lines that go from the x to the y. So no, in this case, I wouldn't even worry about that too much. I basically created three lines, three horizontal lines, at, you know, from 0 to 50, at 0, 10, and 20. That's kind of what's going on over there. OK. In terms of then going through and computing some placement points, we went through and broke it up you know, from 0 to 1 with 10 points, per point of parameter, quadding, flattening, and ultimately creating this little extruded panel. So that part looks pretty familiar. Okay, adaptive component by points. Okay, so so far so good. That that starts looking very familiar. Okay, let's take a look at those adaptive components because we can start doing things with them. For example, we could go ahead and use element override color in view, and let's kind of talk about that function for a little bit. It's element. Pretty sure it's in here. Dot override color in view. Let's talk about that. Element override color in view. Let's kind of pop it over here. I'm going to feed it some elements. So if I want to feed it all the elements, I want to change them all. I'm going to grab all those adaptive components and pop it right down there. That's kind of good. We now need to give it some sort of color information. So let's think about this, how colors are defined. Colors are defined, probably the best way is in the function called color by ARGB, where you feed it some different values. Okay, they have just red and blue and green, okay, or you can create any color you want to. And how this works is we basically feed it an R value, a G value, a B value. The alpha value, you can almost think about the transparency of the color, okay, but we feed in some numbers and that generates a color. For example, if you really wanted a very strong red color that would look like this, you'd say zero, take care, have a good tour. Say 255. Say zero, zero. Okay, so that is strictly red. I'll pop that over here to red and the zeros. Okay, and I'll say take all those panels and color them all red. Okay, let's see what happens here. It should work. Oh. I think I have to do is it, you know, am I backwards on the A? The default value is 255. Never mind. <laughs> okay, it's, by making it zero, it was a completely transparent red. <laughs> and let's see what's going on here. You should be doing it. What's going on? Oh, what may be happening in this is I have the ever popular that I have two panels sitting right on top of each other, so you can't see them. Because I open it with panels, and Dynamo's creating some panels. So 
Let's do this. We'll go through and highlight all the panels. Get rid of them. Oh, come on there. Okay, then we'll rerun the Dynamo script. Let me just run it manually. I think I'm trying to like uh, get ahead of it. you what are you doing there was definitely two on top of each other why are you not updating for me now ours are the same yeah ours are the same let's do i'm gonna take the points out mm -hmm. let me run that i'm gonna reconnect them back in here i'm gonna run that and what i should get is a list of panels Okay, and then finally these are all changed to that color. So let's see how that looks. There we go. A bunch of red panels. Not a lot of work to get a bunch of red panels. If you want to get a bunch of blue panels instead of that, let's go ahead and just change the, uh, one of the other values. If you mix red and blue, you get a nice purple color. It's a nice little purple color in here, a little red and blue mixed together. Okay, I might have to run that again. Okay, so we can change all the panels really easily. And we have these different sort of colors. Let's go ahead and come up with another color that might be a good one for us. So let's come up with a yellow color. Okay, yellow, as far as I remember, is going to be made by mixing red and green. But let's try it. What I'm going to do so I have two different colors to work with is I'm just going to duplicate this little block of code right here. I'm going to copy that and paste that down. I think yellow is red and green. Let's take a look at that. Okay. Okay. So blue and green. Blue and green is yellow. Yeah. Okay. No yellow. Oh, it's like that color. Yeah. Let's just see. We got two colors to work with now. I'll run this. Okay, that's not. That's pretty yellowy. Okay, so I got a couple of different colors. I can really define as many different colors as I want to. In fact, I can define a range of colors, which might be pretty nice. That's not what we're going to do when we do the you know, photograph, because you don't really necessarily want to have to define 255 different colors. You want to say, give me some colors from 0 to 255, and based on whatever number you feed it, you go through and kind of colorize it that way. But we'll start with this. OK, so I got some single solid colors. That's good. What's happening is I'm overriding all the colors in view. That's kind of looking pretty good. Other colors to sort of know about, if you want white, White is 255, 255, 255, mm -hmm. yeah. and black is 0, 0, 0. Mm -hmm. Okay, beautiful. So if we don't want to override every element, let's say you want to create a nice checkerboard. Okay, let's think about how you might do that. The idea is what I really want to do is go through, and if you think about how the panels were created, they're probably created 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, like that. So we need to find a way to sort of separate this group right here like into like uh, two different groups. One group of color blue or purple, one group of color yellow. Okay. So we can do that a couple different ways. In general, when you're trying to create a pattern like that, what you try to do is use, oh, if you can define the pattern mathematically, you can use some sort of code block to do that. Let me kind of show you what I mean. So if, for example, we say, let me count the number of panels, list count. Pop it in. Oh, there it is. It's down there a little low. Remove that second one. Okay. We have a total of however many it comes up with. I have to automate this. This is actually pretty uh, easy or pretty quick. 
We have a total of like 10 panels there right now, something like that. If we want to go through and basically grab every other panel, there's different schemes of doing this. One way is to say, let's go ahead and do a code block. And I can go zero, two. Okay, I'm gonna go the uh, I'm gonna say number of panels. Put two dots in there. I've been doing that a long a lot incorrectly lately. Minus one. And do it in increments of one. Let's think about this. Let's see what that looks like. If I feed the number of panels. Here's what it's going to return. This is actually going to return for like 0 through 17. Now I have 18 panels. You might want to know why am I going 0 to 17? It's because of that indexing thing. Mm -hmm. And we're always off by 1. So this is actually going by 1. OK, super. This would grab all the different panels. If I change it to going by 2s, Okay, it'll get every other panel. Okay, and now what I can do is say list get item at index. And use that as the index. And use this list of panels. And basically what I'm doing is getting every other panel. So what I can do is say great. Let's take every other panel and give it the other color. I have to do, I guess, the override color in view. Now, this isn't the only way to do it. It's not necessarily even the most efficient way of doing it, but it's an easy way to do it. You can go through and basically start switching them around so every other one changes to the color. Create a nice checkerboard. You can think about doing threes. It's really almost anything that you can define mathematically. The game is to really figure out some sort of way to mathematically separate things in terms of what you want and what you don't want. Another sort of way you could sort of play with this is if, for example, you wanted to go through and do everything where if the panel is either beyond something or above something, somehow distinguish the colors that way. You can sort of somehow break it up so if it's above 10 feet or above 20 feet, you have different colors, you know, all sorts of different things. So to do that, what we would need to do is, again, just find some way to sort it out. Here I sorted it out based on this kind of every other as a way of doing it. Let's try another way of doing this. I could go ahead and take all those elements and see if I can find this function. I think it's centroid. Element.centroid. Center? Let's see if I can find it. Contains that. What is it? Is, is it not centroid? What is it? I want Center point? Is it center point? I don't know. <laughs> I just call it. It turns an average point of the properties of centroid. Oh, the centroid of a solid bounding box perimeter. I want an element thing. Let me see what I can do with this. Because what I really want to do is for that element, see what I can do here. Name, curve, by arc, element types. Oh, elevation looked pretty good. There's the width. Position. The position of the model text element. Oh, but position might actually, there's height. The height of the element. I'm trying to figure out point, the point. Is location in there? Let's try this. Ah, element location is it. OK, you knew it would find it eventually. OK, element location is basically going to return the x, y, z location of the element. That could be good. Is that a specific thing, clockwork? So we should download the package clockwork? Oh, clockwork is another one. Is that actually part of it? It is. Okay. Cool. Okay. So clockwork is another fantastic package to download. My two favorites are lunchbox and clockwork. Okay. 
Although, this would probably be a pretty easy kind of function to go to define if you take a look at it. <laughs> if I get the location, it looks like it's a pretty uh, interesting function in that if I give it an element, it's going to give me the corner points. It's going to go through and give me the curves. It's going to tell me if it is a point or is a curve, has a location. It'll tell me a lot of things about it. So that looks like a pretty reasonable function to work with. OK, so let's take a look at what it does. If, for example, we return all these different points for these 10 different elements, how many are there? Oh, so points is the first list. And it looks like there's a series of points there. So six by three, is that what I have? Oh, that's all the corner points. Hmm. A little bit different. That's returning all the corner points. Current end points has location. But we're going to get the center point of that. Yeah, I'm going to defer on this one right now in terms of that. We're going to find some function that will give us like the center points of the highest point of that, and then like that goes to that. But again, I want to show you about the image, so we're not going to have to get too deep in that right now. But we the idea is, what's that? We can't download clockwork. It's like being weird right now, so that's okay. good. Anyways. No worries. Okay, so patterns are pretty easy. Is basically the issue. You just got to sort panels into either you meet a criteria, or you don't meet a criteria. But let's talk about the whole image example and how you start working with that. And to do that, why don't you go ahead and open up 8.5. So the idea here is we again have some surface, some surface that we panelize. That's not going to be too interesting. That should look very much the same as what we've been doing so far. So however you generate that. Whether you just sort of have a surface, or you created lines and generated the surface by lofting things, either way will sort of work. Okay. But what we want to do is select that surface, put some panels on it, and then thinking about some color values. And the basic algorithm we're going to use, or the whole method to our madness, is going to look something like this. We're going to select an image file by using a couple of nodes. We're going to say, basically, let's go ahead and get some file from a path. So we're going to go out and grab some file. And from that image file, we're going to actually read some color values. So you can basically say, hey, let's grab a file. Let's go ahead and get some pixels out of that image. Okay? And then we can go through and just basically take those color values and start mapping them by using element override color and view. So I'm kind of mapping those back to our panels instead. So it's actually pretty interesting because of doing that. This whole middle section here about chopping or transposing or reversing, actually, I guess I don't need to chop because this one right over here changed a little bit. So I'll take that part out. But this is all about just depending upon if the image is facing the right way or not facing the right way, sometimes we need to do a little bit of adjusting to the image by just sort of either kind of, you know, as you think about it, you could just sort of flip things row-wise, or you might have to sort of organize them into columns and flip them column-wise, depending on if you need to flip or whatever you need. Actually, for these things, I always post these maps out on the web, so you can grab them there, too, in terms of what's going on. But let's go ahead and just kind of dig into it and sort of see. So it all starts with selecting an image file, reading the color values, and then applying the color values and then doing a little flipping around as necessary. Okay. So if you can, let's go over and take a look at that. We'll say, hey, here's our image file, or our service file. We'll go out to Dynamo and take a look. So opening up 8.5, let's see what we get ourselves in trouble with. We'll have that little problem, but I'm not going to worry about that too much. Here's my preview not working. OK, so let's take a look. It all starts with this whole notion of we got that surface. We're going to got that surface. We have some surface points at parameter. We're going to place some adaptive panels, the rectangular seamless panel. 
So that part, let's just string it together. That part's pretty easy. You know how to string that part together. So we will go out and select our surface out there. We'll say, great, I got a surface. I'm going to bring it down here, put some points at that. I'll go for a certain number of points in both directions. Okay. Looks like I actually need to put in some values there in terms of the U and the V. The number of rows and columns. I'm going to go through and grab these guys. I'm going to say 10 rows and 20 columns and pull that in over here. What's actually going to happen here is if I feed in 10 or 20, it's going to basically create U plus 1, V plus so it's 21 points. So I get 20 panels and 10 panels. OK, so let's string those down into here. And let's string that down into there. Beautiful. We're going to do some subdividing. We're going to take those quad points. I'm going to flatten that list of quad points. I'm going to apply the rectangular seamless panel. And that part is going to look at OK. So let's go ahead and just run that and see if we can at least make a nice big flat surface out of that. Let me come back over here, maybe pan that over so you can sort of see better. Run this over here. Super. Well, I got points anyway. Let's see why I don't see any panels. What's happening over here with my adaptive component? I think that's actually a perfectly reasonable node. It may be broken because it's an older version. So in this case, what I'm going to do is just basically reload the node. So I'm pretty sure that logic should work. So I'm just going to say adaptive component by points and reload the node. I almost think sometimes if they update the version and the node's called exactly the same thing, there could be confusion about like what has to happen in the background. So. I'll swap that in as points. Remove that one. Let's try running that. I bet it'll work this time. <laughs> okay. So I so far have a big old panelized surface. Not too bad looking, but let's go back over here. Okay, do you got a panelized surface kind of hanging in the background? Yeah. Excellent, then you are ready to start playing with an image file. Okay, for the image file, let's do this. You just need to find an image somewhere out there on your desktop, okay? I always grab these images of my dogs and myself together, <laughs> but you can go through and grab whatever you like. What we're going to do is, there's file path. From the file path, we're going to do file from path, and then image read from file. OK, let's take a look at what that looks like. So I probably have an image that you don't have. You might have to download somewhere or something on your desktop. Let me go to, I'm going to go to my Dropbox. And I keep a bunch of stuff hanging around. See what you can find in like, a, oh, just on the desktop or in the, uh, the, the Windows Pictures folder. See if you can find anything in there. I have these little things I call badge images. OK, so let's go ahead and I'll grab this one. That's my dogs and myself. Pop that in there. OK, so. So here's how it's going to work. We are going to start by reading a file from an image. That's going to basically read that file from the path. Okay. And then what we want to do is just break that down into some pixel information, some color information. Okay. And how we're going to do that is there's something called image pixels that lets us take an image and take basically a sampling scheme, like 10 by 20 here, and then it will sample the image, just looking for the color values at those different points. So go ahead and take the image down there. And let's try running that and see what happens. So we'll do that. And let's look at these values and see what's going on. OK. 
these values, and we zoom on in here, you might see our range in this value. You've got a bunch of color values there. It looks like I have a bunch of different rows. It looks like I have 10 values in each of the different rows. And I'm betting there's going to be 20 columns, or vice versa. It depends how you want to think about this. Okay. But basically, just so you have a sense of what it's doing as it's reading it, as best I understand, I've done a lot of playing around with this. The way it samples the image looks like this. If my image is like this, my understanding is that it samples by going here, 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 and then comes up to the second row. So as best as I track this, it starts in the lower right-hand corner and goes what I think of as backwards, <laughs> but from top to bottom. A bottom of the top, excuse me. OK, but again, we'll see what happens. And based on how it's sampling versus how our images got laid, or our panels got laid out, we may need to flip them or rotate them. We may need to do something to them to go through and adjust that and make that happen. Do you know where the origin is in, in Redmond, in the southwest? Oh, it depends. It's like it's um, generally, yes, it's in the southwest, but it depends on where the object has been placed relative to, there is an absolute zero, 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 and it's just where you happen to put the object on the, the playing field. So you could, be in, you could be in the northeastern quadrant, or you might actually be, it just sort of depends. So there's a little mystery. We'll get into that a little bit more next time in terms of really how we debug all that. Okay, but once we have these color values, at a high level, here's what we can do. We can say, I got color values, I got uh, panels. What I can do is just go through and take those color values. I'm trying to find uh, my pan over here. And just take them over to the panels. So I have the panels over here. I will go through and pop those in as elements. I can apply the color values. And if I just take them apart, across, straight across, and I don't do anything, okay, and just run that, you will actually get something that has some sort of colorization. This looks a little strange right now. Let me see if it's shaded consistently or what's going on over there. Let me orbit it around a little bit. I got some values in there. It almost looks like I have, oh, values, they're all in this first row. There's not much going on in the second row. I might have something goofy going on in terms of my, uh, looks like there's other ones under there, maybe. Let me try this. I'm going to remove all the panels. It's interesting. Well, let's take a look. I think it's really just a question of hierarchy and order. Oh, well, I'll tell you what the order of the problem is right now. The problem is if I look at this list of colors, this list of colors has hierarchy. The list of panels doesn't have hierarchy. So what I'm going to do is actually just flatten out that list, and then it'll uh, be OK. And in terms of doing that, I can say list flatten. Because what you basically do is getting the same ones over and over on top of each other. So we'll do that. Remove that. I'll do this over here. This is definite so I'll take my colors, I'll flatten that by one, and I'll apply that as the colors. Now, you'll see that as a first you know, trial, the colors probably aren't going to be mapping to the right locations. And that's okay. That's what we're going to do in terms of flipping it around a little bit. Because what we do is we have data values that were read in. <coughs> Why did nothing show up? 
adaptive components? No, list them. What did I do? You have their flattened color. I flattened the color. Say what? The one you have at the end of the blue box. Yes. You just flatten it there. Oh, that's flattening completely. I'm skimming it now. I just did that one sort of bypass it right now. I think that I must have done something goofy to sort of remove the surface or something like that because yeah, it's. I got the panel surfaces. What's going on over here? It's just not regenerating that. Let me try this again. I got my points. I think I got my points. Let me try reconnecting that. Okay. So we got. I got my adaptive panels. It still says null there. I don't know why it's saying null there, because that should be a good list over here, and that should be a good list over here. I've sort of broken it somehow, and it could just be me breaking it. Let me try that again. Since I have that little error floating in the background, I'm a little worried about what's going on there. Let me try bringing that in again. Okay, I think I'm getting panels now. It's taking a long time. We'll say override color in view. And what tends to happen in this is that really as a starting point, we're just going to be off. It did work in the back on there now. We're putting the colors on there. You don't know this photo, but I actually do. And I can actually tell you, it's not all that bad. What happens is, oh, as you look at it, it's actually more oriented this way. It looks like I'm sort of um, interlaced in a sort of funny way here. I have like, almost like two copies of the image with that kind of window behind me. This is my head. The dogs are there in here. <laughs> it looks like what's happening is if we broke it further, we would actually tend to get a finer resolution. But somehow, the data and the way it's organized here, the way I'm mapping it, is not quite right with each other, and that's what we're going to play around in the blue box. We're going to take those data values and the way they're read in, and the data uh, points, and do a little chopping, transposing, and reversing to try and flip that around and kind of get them in the right order. We'll do that next time. Okay. okay. But at a starting point, that's the essence of what we need. Read that, panels put them together, everything else is just going in terms of flipping, rotating, happens in like those five or six nodes, and getting them in the right order. Okay. Let us adjourn for today and have yourself a great weekend. <laughs>